Hello and welcome to Temple Talk. This is Yitzhak Rubin. Today is the 15th day of the month of Sivan, 5779, June 18th, 2019. This coming Shabbat, we'll be reading the Parashat Shalach. Send for yourselves. Parashat Shalach. As you may have noticed, I didn't introduce Rabbi Richmond because the rabbi is currently en route to America. And uh, before I forget, and if you haven't heard yet, uh, you should know that uh, the rabbi will be speaking, one speaking engagement, on June 30th. It's a Sunday in Lubbock, Texas. That's June 30th. For more information, you can go to our website, templeinstitute.org, go to the events page, or go to our Facebook page, and you'll see it posted there as well. That is in Lubbock, Texas, on June 30th. The rabbi and Mrs. Richmond will both be speaking uh, at the South Plains Hebraic Center in Lubbock, Texas. Back to our parsha, our Torah reading, the fourth Torah reading of the book of Numbers, the book of uh, Bamidbar in the desert or in the wilderness. And uh, Shalach is really the watershed parsha of of the book of numbers it's the uh, watershed moment of the entire experience of the israelites in the desert and it's a watershed moment for the people of israel uh, throughout our history um, as we know up to this point Israel's getting ready to enter into the land of Israel. The people of Israel into the land of Israel, uh, they have received Torah at Mount Sinai. They have built the tabernacle according to Hashem's instructions. They have uh, encamped around the tabernacle. Hashem has commanded uh, to Moshe and Aaron how the encampment will move forward uh, as it uh, approaches the land of Israel which of the Levites will carry what when they uh, disassemble the tabernacle and, and march on with it. And of course, uh, according to the cloud of glory that rests upon the tabernacle, uh, that is when the Israelites will, will strike camp and uh, when they'll move forward and when they will settle down again uh, as they move their way through the desert and approach the land of Israel. It's all been planned out to a T. Uh, every detail, God has not left anything out. And we see at this point, this has been God's plan from the very beginning. Uh, the exodus, the liberation of Israel from Egypt was not simply to uh, liberate them from slavery and to uh, make their lives better, but uh, there was a more involved, and uh, the ultimate plan, God's ultimate plan, was to bring his people back into the land that he had originally promised them, to Avraham, to Yitzhak, and to Yaakov, the land that he said they would be returning to and would dwell in forever, the land in which they will fulfill the commandments uh, embodied in the Torah and build a, a nation and a society that is uh, based on Torah and that uh, is uh, centered around the Mikdash, the Holy Temple, in which God's presence will rest. That's the whole plan. That's always been the plan. And uh, God made sure that it was going to work. And, you know, there's an expression that uh, man plans and God laughs. You've heard that expression? I would say in this case, man, God planned and man screwed up royally. Seems to come out of, out of nowhere. Uh, the, 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 the parashat uh, Shalach opens up uh, chapter 13, verse 1. anotin Israel Ish echad, ish echad lemate. Lemate avotav tishlahu kol nasivahem. 
opens up, God saying to Moshe, Send for yourself, shalach lacha. It's an interesting expression. Shalach means to send, but lacha means for yourself. People who will spy out or will uh, basically um, uh, tore out the land. They will, uh, they'll, they'll, um, they're not exactly spies, but they're, they're basically a, a sort of like a congressional mission. It's made up of the 12 um, representatives of, uh, of, the, of the 12 tribes of Israel. So that's everyone, every tribe will be represented and uh, they'll all be able to participate in this in this little uh, pilot trip, pilot trip into the land. So the question arises immediately, um, why and whose idea is this? The, uh, the, the expression, shalach lecha, send for yourselves, suggests, as our sages have said, uh, that God was responding to, to uh, a request or a proposal that uh, Israel send in these, these spies or this mission um, in advance, just to give them uh, an idea of what they're gonna, what they're gonna see. You know what's gonna be like when they enter the land, and it wasn't uh, really a commandment. God didn't say this is what you need to do. God was saying, okay, go ahead and do it. Now this idea is actually reinforced when we read Moshe's description of what happened in his own words in the book of uh, Deuteronomy. Um, in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 20, I'm sorry, not verse 20. Um, oh yeah, verse 20, let's start with that. This is Moshe speaking. Then I said to you, you have come until the Amorite mountain that Hashem our God gives us. See, Hashem your God has placed the land before you. Go up and possess as Hashem, God of your fathers, has spoken to you. Do not fear and do not lose resolve. All of you approached me and said, let us send men ahead of us and let them spy out the land and bring word back to us the road on which we should ascend and the cities to which we should come. The idea was good in my eyes, so I took from you 12 men, one man from each tribe. They turned and ascended the mountain and came unto the valley of Eshkol and spied it out. They took it into their hands from the fruit of the land and brought it down to us. They brought back word to us and said, good is the land that Hashem our God gives us. So. According to Moshe's testimony here, yes, it was the idea of the people. Democracy in action, the people have requested that they send a, a group of notables ahead of them, just to, you know, so uh, they didn't have uh, ways in those days. They wanted uh, some advance notification of what roads to travel on, what cities to turn to seems reasonable enough as Moshe said it seemed like a good idea so that's exactly what they did so Moshe appointed the uh, the 12 uh, notables from the 12 tribes and gave them instructions and their instructions were it says back in our Parsha Shalach it says in chapter 13 of Numbers verse 17 Moshe said sent Moshe sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, and he said to them, Ascend here in the south and climb the mountain. See the land. How is it? And the people that dwell in it, is it, uh, is it strong or weak? Is it few or numerous? And how is the land in which it dwells? Is it good or bad? And how are the cities in which it dwells? Are they open or, or are they fortified? And how is the land? Is it fertile or is it lean? Are there trees in it or not? You shall strengthen yourselves and take from the fruit of the land. Okay. So we have some questions. I mean, God's always described this land to Israel as a land of, of milk and honey, uh, a land with, uh, with abundant resources. So why are they asking now, is it fruitful? Is it fertile? Um, are, they, are they questioning um, what, what God has already promised them? As far as the people who dwell there, Fair enough. Uh, are they numerous or not? Are they strong or not? Uh, but again, God has consistently said, this is the land that you're going to inherit. This is the land I promised. So, yes, if it's for tactical reasons, you know, how do we, 
how do we plan our approach, then it all makes sense. But uh, if it's just to, you know, for some encouragement or reinforcement, is it really necessary? It wasn't God's word enough? Do you really need to, to go through with this? It's a question. And so the question arises whether, at which point did things go awry? Um, was the idea one that should have been nixed from the start? Was the, was the makeup of the contingent that went into the land, the 12 notables, was that the fatal flaw here? Um, were, was it the instructions that Moshe gave them? Should he have been more specific? Or should he have given other instructions? Should he have just said, go out and, and um, you know, see, see the conditions of the roads, you know? Do, are we going to be able to walk on the roads? I don't know. Uh, it, it seemed very vague and, and, and not, uh, not quite well thought out, this whole, this whole plan. Then, of course, the 12 leaders of the 12 tribes do go, and they spend 40 days in the land, and they come back, and they give their report. And uh, it says here, again in chapter 13, verse 27, they reported to him, to Moshe, and said, We arrived at the land to which you sent us, and indeed it flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Okay, so far, so good. But... But the people that dwells in the land is powerful. The cities are fortified and very great. And we also saw there the offspring of the giants. Amalek dwells in the area of the south. The Hittite, the Jebusite, and the Amorite dwell in the mountain. And the Canaanite dwells by the sea in the banks of the Jordan. So they started out saying everything is just as God has always described it. Flowing with milk and honey fruitful in fact they brought back the those those large uh, large cluster of grapes that it took two men uh, to carry as they tied the cluster to a to a long uh, branch and they carried it together that's how bountiful the land was um, but then they uh, mentioned about the people the giants they saw they they uh, gave a lot of information and not just information, uh, but you can see their information is also uh, tinged with some interpretation. They say the, the people that dwell in the land is powerful. How do they know they're powerful? What evidence do they see that they're powerful? In fact, the cities are fortified. Fortified city meaning, in Hebrew, the, uh, literally meaning that they were walled cities. So a walled city is a city that has built up a defense because they don't feel so fortified. They don't feel so, so strong. They have to uh, protect themselves. An unwalled city would be a, a rep reflect a, a people that, that um, feel their own strength and uh, don't feel threatened. So immediately they are interpreting. You know, there's a wonderful uh, organization called uh, Honest Reporting. And uh, Honest Reporting, it's, it's, it's a website, and um, it says, Honest Reporting, Defending Israel from Media Bias. And yes, they, they study the international media, mainly the he Eng English language, uh, every day, all stories about Israel, and they uh, look for media bias. And then when they find it, they contact uh, the media, was guilty of the bias and and uh, report reported to them, lodge their complaint, and specify why they uh, feel that they're using me using media bias. And they accuse. So they saw an article they put out this week. They accuse the spies of also engaging in media bias. Uh, and as a, a little pitch for themselves, they said, you know, if they were around at the time, they could have undone the damage that the spies had caused by pointing out to these eight categories of media bias that they say the spies were guilty of. So let's just look quickly at uh, their list. Number one, misleading terminology. Uh, it's the use of language to prejudice an audience. The spies told the nation, we were like grasshoppers in our eyes. Um, so... 
that metaphor, uh, you know, if you're like grasshoppers and, and you're describing the, uh, the people living there as giants and you're telling your audience that there's no way, we have no chance there. They'll, they'll literally squash us. Now, what they didn't point out here is that the concept that we were grasshoppers in our eyes, which is, is they, they mentioned in, in, in again, our chapter 13, uh, verse 33. What does that mean in our eyes? Not in the eyes of the, of the people dwelling in the land. We thought ourselves to be puny. We were, we were demeaning ourselves. So what does that say about their mindset to begin with? The second uh, uh, sin of media bias that uh, honest reporting accuses the spies of is imbalanced reporting, distorting, th distorting news through dis disproportionate coverage. The spies listed the seven Canaanite nations individually rather than using the collective Canaanite description, implying greater numbers, meaning they didn't lie. Nobody's, they didn't say any lies here. They told the truth, but they told it in such a way that magnified the strength and the numbers of the people dwelling in the land. Yes, there are seven distinct nations to the collective Canaanite nation. And if you say, yeah, we saw the Canaanites there, they're there, just like we knew they were there, that's like a little less daunting than saying, than describing each of the seven Canaanite nations that actually dwell there. Furthermore, the spies' reference to Amalek was merely a scare tactic. Mention, me, meant to raise, raise memories of the Battle of Rephidim from Exodus 17, 8 through 13. This, again, I'm, I'm re reading what the uh, honest reporting is, is calling imbalanced reporting. As the Amalekites weren't Canaanites. They weren't a prerequisite. Conquering them, fighting them, was not a prerequisite to entering and, and um, uh, inheriting the land. Three, selective omission is the withholding of key details or stories controlling access to information. The spies who saw the land never mentioned things they saw that would have aroused the nation's interest, such as the Temple Mount, referred to then as Mount Moriah, Hebron's Tomb of the Patriarchs, Rachel's Tomb near, near Bethlehem, and also Beth El, where Yaakov dreamed of angels ascending and descending, meaning they peppered their report with ominous facts, but they actually omitted uh, facts which would have been very uh, encouraging to the people. Number four in the list of media bias sins that honest reporting is, is uh, quote, accusing the spies of employing. Number four, using true facts to draw false conclusions. The spies told the nation that, quote, the land devours its inhabitants, end quote. Rabbinic commentaries explain that God caused Canaanites to die to distract the inhabitants from taking notice of the spies, meaning if everybody's conducting funerals, then they're not going to notice these 12 men, uh, you know, walking uh, on the outskirts of their cities. Um, but, the Scott, but the spies drew the wrong conclusions. They saw people dying and thought, well, this is a, a, a deadly place. You know, the, the land is... Is, is devouring its inhabitants. Further, the spies describe the cities as fortified to create the impression of Canaan's, Canaan's military power, but fortified cities prove the opposite, as we mentioned before. The weaker a community is, the more fortifications it requires. Number five in the list, again, I'm reporting, honest reporting, list of um, uh, media bias sins. Number five, distorting facts is simply getting the facts wrong. The spies brought back large fruit to prove they say, to prove how bizarre the Holy Land was, but the fruit wasn't bizarre, it was miraculously special. I don't know, I'm, I'm, not, I can, I'm not sure I can agree with number five in uh, the honest reporting list of, uh, of sins here, but um, I'm gonna move on to, to number six. Opinions disguises news is when a reporter injects his or, own, his or her own opinion and interpretation of events, the spies clearly overstep their mandate by telling the nation, we cannot extend, it is too strong for us, right? They, that was their final, their final statement after they reported to all the things they saw. That really wasn't called for, it wasn't asked for, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't part of their mission to, to, to make that statement. 
And number seven, lack of transparency is when reporters fail to be open or accountable to their audience. Rabbinic teaching explains that the spies had a conflict of interest with their mission. As princes, they feared that when a nation finally settled the Holy Land, they would lose their status of authority. Yes, this has always been uh, a major uh, concept that, yes, they were not professional spies. They were people of stature. They were celebrities. And uh, they had a status in the desert. And yes, they might have had a bias. You know, we're going to enter into this land. We're all going to disperse into our own, uh, our own uh, areas of settlement. And, you know, new leadership will arise and, and overtake us and we'll lose our, statu our status and our stature. So uh, as far as we're concerned, uh, we have no motivation to enter the land. That would be... That's that line of thinking. And finally, number eight in this list of by honest reporting, lack of context, is when a reporter distorts a story by removing a frame of reference. The missing context from the spies report was that God had already promised a land, the holy land to the Jewish people. It was well known that the Jewish people that God had promised a land to Abraham and to, ya and to Yitzchak and to Yaakov and even to Moshe uh, right, bef right before uh, they sent the, the, the mission of, of 12 notables. God, again, emphasized that he, the land was guaranteed. So they were ignoring that and, um, and uh, providing their own uh, spin. So basically, as Honest Reporting has pointed out here, these are, and, and they have, these aren't original ideas. The one about the distorting the uh, idea of the large fruit uh, somehow is reflecting that the land was bizarre I've never heard before. But all the other ideas are all ideas that our sages have, uh, have all discussed. Yes, they, um, they, uh, they, they exceeded their, their uh, mission um, and they, they stated things that weren't necessary and they stated things that were uh, distorted distorted the reality, even though they did not say any untruths. They stuck with the facts, but they colored the facts and distorted the facts for whatever reason. Here's the music. We'll pick this up. Right. We'll pick this up. Just one moment. Stay with me. Temple Talk. This is Yitzchak Ruven here in Jerusalem, Israel. Today is the 15th day of the month of Sivan, 5779, June 18th, 2019. As I mentioned before, Rabbi Richmond is en route to the United States of America. And uh, I'll mention once again, on the 30th of June, he will be speaking. He and Mrs. Richmond will both be speaking in Lubbock, Texas. That's on the 30th of June. And you can find more details on our website, templeinstitute.org, on the events page, and on our Facebook page. Back to our parsha, Shlach. This watershed moment when the spies, the 12 notables that Moshe sent into the land, upon the popular request of the people, it was a request that was sanctioned by God, and... Uh, they sent in these 12 notables, and they came back with a report which turned out to be a diba. Diba is the Hebrew word, which means, I guess you could translate it as slander. They spoke evil, evil words, evil tongue, evil language against the land. Again, as we pointed out earlier, uh, with the help of uh, our friends from Honest Reporting, reported that it wasn't the facts that they changed or distorted, but simply the way they presented them. They used their words will, wittingly or unwittingly, and that will always be a question. Were they aware, uh, those who say that they might have been 
uh, nervous about losing their stature as leaders if they went into the land uh, will say that they wittingly uh, colored their language in such a way to 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 uh, uh, sour the people on the idea of entering the land and to take the wind out of the sails uh, of the people. But it could have been that uh, they simply, um, you know, they they got scared. They they uh, got spooked. Something something happened, and. Uh, they presented the land, even though they presented it in a very positive way. They somehow managed to interpret that and convey that understanding that that it was not positive, that it was too much for the people. They couldn't possibly. And of course, immediately after they concluded uh, their report, two of the spies, two of the twelve, Akalev ben Yifune and uh, Yoshua ben Nun. Caleb and Joshua both said, wait, that's not the case at all. They, 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 they tore their garments. I'm back in chapter 14 now. And uh, this is after the, the entire people were, were so rattled by the report that they said, let's just turn around and go back into Egypt. Let's point a new leader. Uh, let's, let's get rid of this uh, Moshe. Let's point a new leader and go back to Egypt. And Moshe and Aaron fell on their faces before the entire congregation of the assembly of the children of Israel. And then in chapter 14, verse 6, Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of uh, Jephunneh, of the spies of the land, tore their garments. They spoke to the entire assembly of the children of Israel, saying, The land we passed to, to spy it out, the land is very, very good. Tov ma'od ma'od in, in Hebrew. Aretz, to, tova aretz ma'od ma'od. It's a beautiful expression. It's, it's, it's reminiscent of, of the, the account of creation when God would s behold what he had created and said it was good, it was very good. And here they're saying this land is very, very good. It doesn't get better than that. And they continue, if Hashem desires it, he will bring us into this land and give us this land that flows with milk and honey. It's, it's, it's like it's, it's up to God, people. It's not up to the inhabitants that live there, how large they are, what they're you know, dimensions are, how, they're, how fortified their cities are. That's, that was never the, the program here. God said he would bring us into the land, and if God wants to do that, by golly, that's what God's going to do. And they continue, but do not rebel against the Shem. You should not fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them. Hashem is with us. Do not fear them. It's interesting that they're lachmenu. They're our bread. Um, it's a very beautiful expression. I don't know exactly what it means. They're our bread, you know. We're gonna, it's gonna eat it up. We're gonna, we're gonna spread butter on it and just eat it up. I mean, there are. That's our meal ticket. These people, they're not to be feared. They're our, our way in. And it says their protection has departed from them. It's very interesting. The Hebrew says, "Sart silam me alehem." Um, it says their their tzilam, their their image has departed from them. What's their image? The image of of Hashem. You know, we're all created in God's image. Their image of it's departed. Why is it departed? Because what has God said earlier? He said that the people in the land will lose possession of the land, not because Israel is so strong, and not because Israel. Uh, deserves it, yes, it has been said, but because they have corrupted the land, the people in the land were 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 benighted, they were corrupt, they were they were uh, their ways were were perverse, and you know as we we read about uh, told repeatedly don't don't follow the ways of the people in the land. Don't make a covenant with them. Stay away from their gods. Stay away from their customs uh, because it is corrupt and perverse and an abomination. And so uh, because of their ways, they have lost their protection. They're no longer, they're no longer uh, under the, they've lost their humanity. They've, they've become so corrupt that they no longer have, have, have God's protection. And so 
the land is open for us. It's our, it's our bread and butter. We just got to go in there and take it. This is Yoshua and Caleb. Now, Yoshua was uh, from the tribe of Ephraim, or was one of the two sons of Yosef. And Caleb was from the tribe of Judah. So, interesting enough, of course, these are the two leadership tribes of Israel. As we know, that Judah would, uh, that David, uh, King David, would come from the tribe of Judah. And uh, they were anointed, really, the leadership role by, by Yaakov when he blessed his 12 sons on his deathbed. He said that uh, Judah would be the tribe of leadership. And Yosef was, of course, the other uh, leader of the 12 tribes. Of course, Yehuda was, was a son of, of uh, uh, Leah, and Yosef was a son of Rachel. Rachel. And, uh, of course, historically, they would eventually a split and be rivals, and uh, the, tri the, the kingdom of Judea would rule uh, from the environs of Jerusalem southward in the land, and north of that would be the kingdom of Israel, which would, would be the first to be overtaken by the Assyrians, and their tribal uh, inhabitants, the, tw the ten tribes, would be dispersed, and then uh, within a hundred years, uh, the uh, uh, kingdom of Judea would also be conquered, and of course they would be sent into the Babylonian exile. But these are the two leaders here who went against the uh, went against the tide, went against the current, uh, went against the bad report of the other ten tribes and said, of course we can we can go up and take this land if this is what God wants. It's a good land, a very, very good land. And interestingly enough, today uh, the inheritances of of Judah and and of Ephraim are what today are the uh, areas, geographical areas in Israel of Judea and Samaria. And of course, Judea and Samaria are are uh, have not been officially uh, declared by Israel as part of the state of Israel, and those are the two areas which are being settled by Israeli settlers, of which there are more than half a million strong now, and these are the these are the people who today say, you know. It, God wants us to have this land so uh, we can take it. You know, we have to be strong and uh, we have to stick to our guns and it's a very, very good land. So very, very interestingly, not only has the media bias problem not gone away and it's become very, very uh, severe in our day, but uh, the two champions of Israel's destiny to settle and to inherit the land of Israel and to create a, a, a society uh, worthy of the God of Israel, these two champions um, are still the champions today. Uh, Caleb and Yoshua, in the guise of the settlers of Judea and Samaria, are the champions of, of settling the land, that we can do it. Now, the punishment, of course, that was to come was uh, severe. God said, because you have despised my land, because you have despised my promise to settle you in that land, you're not going to go in at all. This generation is going to die in the desert and only its children are going to enter. You know, the, the, the 10 of the 12, um, or I guess the people all said, you know, our children will die we go in there our young our young people will, will be will be murdered will be massacred was it a sincere concern or was it um, a justification for their own fears uh, and for their own uh, considerations uh, of why they might not want to go in so uh, God kind of sticks it to him and says well, you know what your children they're going to be the ones who will go in they're going to be the ones who will inherit the land because my promise is my promise that's not going to change but you who have despised my land you're not going in. And so 
course, this evil report and the response of the people throwing up their hands in despair and crying uh, all throughout the night over nothing. Of course, it was the ninth of Av, and God said that uh, because you cried over nothing, I'll give you something to cry for in this night. And of course, the ninth of Av is the day that both the first temple built by King Solomon and the second temple that was built when the uh, Jews returned from Babylon with Ezra. Uh, both temples were destroyed on the ninth of Av, and Israel has since then also been plagued with many, many uh, calamities and disasters that have occurred on the ninth of Av. So God kept his promise that because the people cried over nothing on that day and turned what should have been a joyous moment of of expectation and anticipation for entering the land and fulfilling the mission uh, of 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 the the people of Israel and for and for making God's dream come true because they abandoned that and cried pointlessly uh, God made sure that uh, their descendants would have a reason to cry on that day so the repercussions of this of this sin, of this grievous error in judgment, and this grievous loss of of resolve, and this grievous uh, uh, abandonment of of the path that God had prepared so carefully and lovingly for them, has had its ramifications uh, to this day, and many of our problems that we face today in the land of Israel are the result of similar uh, vacillation. For example, the Temple Mount, which we shied away from when first liberating it 52 years ago in 1967 and uh, didn't, didn't take it um, and make it our own and uh, still tiptoe around in the Temple Mount and still aren't allowed to pray because well, we're like grasshoppers in, in our eyes, right? In our eyes, we're like grasshoppers. So this, this attitude is still with us. It's still part of us, unfortunately. And this is what we are trying, certainly we at the Temple Institute and what many people in today in, in Israel are trying to extirpate, is that the word, extirpate? not exactly sure. Rabbi's not here to help me. Uh, we're trying to rid it, cleanse our system of this lingering sense of doubt in ourselves and doubt in God, God forbid. Now, interestingly enough, and uh, meaningfully enough, God, God's anger over this incident far, far, far exceeded God's anger over the incident of the golden calf when Israel, feeling that Moshe had left them, uh, that they're going to create a new, quote, leader, a golden calf, right? So this, of course, was an abomination. Of course, it was a violation of one of the Ten Commandments that they had, Israel had only received uh, 40 days earlier. And so um, God was uh, not pleased with this, but upon Moshe's urging, he accepted uh, uh, the people's repentance and basically decided to move on. Let's just wipe the, sl wipe the slate clean and move on. But here, there's no moving on. Why? Because God is much more zealous over the honor of the land than God is over his own honor. But also because the land, and this is a very important lesson that people have to hear today, the land is integral to everything that God has promised Israel. The land is integral to God's relationship with Israel. The land is integral to the nation of Israel being the nation of Israel. It's not a, it's not a, uh, 
you know, uh, uh, there's a Hebrew word, chupar. It's a slang word. It's not a, you know, it's not the icing on the cake. It's not the cherry on top. It's not a, a freebie. It is essential. It's essential in order to perform all the commandments of the Torah that we've received. It's essential because there and only there is where a house is going to be built, where God's presence will dwell. It's not, you know, it's not a coincidence. It's not a, it's not a happenstance. It's not a, uh, just a, um, you know, a, a nice idea that we're going to all uh, live in Israel. It is an imperative. It's essential. To God. It's, it's essential. It's part of God's plan from the beginning of creation. As we know from the first Rashi in the, in the first uh, verse of, of Genesis, when God created the heaven and the earth, and Rashi said, why, why do we start the Torah here? We started with the commandments. After all, it's a book of commandments. It's not a book of world history. So we started here because when God created the land, earth, and in Hebrew, land and earth, it's the same, uh, same word, aretz. When God created the Aretz, he was making it clear that this Aretz was created for his people to dwell in from the very beginning, from the very beginning. So you, you take out this element of the land of Israel from the mission and the purpose and the, and the, and the reality of the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, and you've completely collapsed God's world. You've completely undermined creation. You've completely undermined the purpose of creation, why God brought us all into being. So making a golden calf, God can give us a pass on that. You know, that was a stupid thing. Um, it was a foolish thing, but it wasn't a game changer. It wasn't a game changer, but, but uh, you know, uh, getting spooked about the land and uh, basically deciding to trash the land, let's just go back to Egypt or go to Uganda or go to anywhere else in the world, uh, you know, it's, that's an attack on everything that God has blessed us with, everything that God has blessed creation with. It is, it is such an integral part of creation itself that to back away from from God's promise uh, that his people would dwell in the land of Israel is to, is to undermine creation and it's a slap in the face, as it were, of, of God and, and our relationship with God. Uh, it's, it couldn't get more serious than that. So here we are, you know, the next events the next real event in the in the Hebrew calendar now since we have uh, beyond the we've completed the cycle of the three of the three pilgrimage festivals for this year well for the Hebrew year we've only we're in the middle but until the fall holidays what's next is is the day of Tisha B'Av and the three weeks that preceded, the three weeks of uh, mourning or, 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 or introspection, I should say. We don't say mourning, introspection, um, uh, that precede the fast day of Tisha B'Av, which is the day that uh, commemorates the destruction of the two temples and the day that commemorates the evil report uh, brought back by the spies. Um, so, you know, this... Uh, Shalach, this event of the spies. Uh, you know, next week we'll read about the next uh, calamity that occurs to Israel in the desert. But um, um, Shalach uh, and the spies, it's, it's something that uh, we're going to be dealing with uh, as, we, as we get closer to Tammuz, which is uh, the month which follows this current month of Sivan. And in which it was the month of Tammuz that uh, that the spies entered into the land, that the twelve notables. You know, I say spies, but there really were twelve notables. And in fact, this week's haftarah, which is uh, which.
which is read uh, this week on Shabbat, which is from the book of, of Joshua, actually tells the story of the two spies, professional spies, spies who were, had a specific mission uh, to go into, into the land, into Jericho, and to spy out and, and see, because the people were really now ready. This is 40 years later. They're ready to enter. And these spies, even though they almost got caught and they only were saved by the uh, cooperation of Rahav, who, who uh, put them up and hid them and told them to escape. With all that, they went back and they said, we can take it, no problem. That's a good report in the land of Israel. So let's just keep in mind, good reports. We can do it. We can take it. It's a very, very good land, the land of Israel. Thanks for being with me, Temple Talk.